going to make this uh, short, sweet. Uh, it's going to be dealing with Islam. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of controversy going on today. Uh, and uh, who's, who's who, what is Islam, is ISIS is Islam, uh, what are the tenets of beliefs of Islam. So we're going to address some of those issues. And hopefully it uh, will help you. Uh, of course, I'm going to show a video, five minute video. It's on jihad and first the crusades. Uh, and there's a form of Islam called political Islam. In fact, um, Islam is not only a religion, it is a political entity. Most of us aren't aware of this. Okay. Uh, the uh, sworn manifesto of Islam is to dominate the world, either through conversion, subjugation, or death. That's it. Conversion, subjugation, or death. Unfortunately, in spite of what our political leaders say, our president, uh, Congress, and many of our notable uh, representatives who say Islam is a vision of peace, they are absolutely incorrect. Right. Okay, we're going to show this video. Whenever you're dealing with an apologist for Islam, or even a Muslim, and you bring up jihad, almost immediately they kick back to you. Well, what about those terrible crusades? Why, they're the moral justification for jihad. I mean, we're just as bad as they are, so let's not talk about jihad, okay? Let's talk about the Crusades. Well, what I would like to talk about here are facts. And it turns out I sat down and put together some work, and I created a database of some 548 battles that Islam fought jihad battles against classical civilization. And this aren't even all the battles. It really doesn't say much about Africa and India. Afghanistan and all that, it's primarily the battles against the classical civilization of Rome and Greece. So, 548 battles is a lot and it's too much to even comprehend. So I created something which I call a dynamic battle map in which you have a display of the Mediterranean and a white dot means that this 20 year period that's a new battle. So every time the screen changes it's 20 year period. They then, the colors white turn to red, so you can see a history. This may seem a little confusing, but I think when you see it, you'll know exactly what I mean. And here it starts. Islam bursts out of the Arabian Peninsula and immediately starts attacking the Middle East. And notice that it doesn't take long until they're crossing the Mediterranean and attacking southern France and Spain. Notice something here. Most people think of Islam, they think of Arabs, they think of Arabs, they think of desert. And yet here we see that Islam is projecting power throughout the Mediterranean. Notice how the little islands of the Mediterranean are getting hammered. The navy of Islam would attack coastal towns, kill, rob, rape, and then take slaves. So this whole battle map as it unfolds, you're seeing slaves being taken. Over a million slaves were taken out of Europe into the Islamic world. That's something you don't think about much, but it's absolutely true. There were over 200 battles fought in Spain alone. And we also see, however, on the east coast in Turkey that Islam is trying to break into Europe. Now what's going to happen is in Spain, this ongoing fight that lasted for 400 years, is the Christians are going to push back the Muslims. But now then what has happened over in the east is that Constantinople has fallen and now then Eastern Europe is getting hammered. The Jihad now comes to Eastern Europe. It's pushed out now of Spain. Northern Africa is now completely Islamic. The Middle East is completely Islamic. This is all Jihad, relentless Jihad. And why is it so relentless? Well, Muhammad was relentless in his Jihad. And these people are good students of Islam, and so it's against the Kafir on and on. It was traditional that when the Sultan came to power, the brand new Sultan, he would immediately try to launch new wars because he was going to be noted in his Islamic history as to how well he fought against the Kafir. So that's what the Jihad looked like over that time period, 548 battles. But remember, when you bring up Jihad, people want to bring up the Crusades. So I also prepared a dynamic battle map of all the offensive raids, 
of the Crusaders. Let's watch it and make a comparison. And so it begins. The Crusades enter into Turkey and the Middle East. Battles go on. But aren't there far fewer than you thought there might be? And here we go. The last battles are fought. And that is the end of the Crusades. So now then we can talk about some facts. Yes, there were Crusades. But notice they ended centuries ago and Jihad is being practiced today. Jihad has been with us for 1400 years. There is no comparison between Jihad and the Crusades. Certainly not a moral comparison. And when you're looking at the Crusades, remember, in one sense, all of the Crusades were defensive wars. Why? Well, as we saw in the first Jihad map, it was Islam that came out of Arabia and conquered the Middle East, a Christian Middle East. And so the Crusaders were trying to free their Christian brothers and sisters from Jihad. So there's no moral comparison at all. The motivation of the Crusaders was to free Christians. The purpose of Jihad is to enslave the Kafir. So the next time you hear somebody talk about all those dreadful crusades, you've seen some facts about the matter. Why don't you pipe up and tell them you know you don't really know the matter? Today, there have been approximately 27,400 some odd Islamic terrorist attacks since 9-11. Over 27,000 terrorist attacks since 9-11. You can imagine the number of people who have been slaughtered, you know, over that number. Uh, Bill mentioned uh, the Kafir. Had different spellings, but I spell it K-A-F-I-R. Some spell it K-U-F-F-I-R. Kafir includes their enemies of all Islam, all Muslims. They include Christians, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, atheists, whoever. Anyone that is not a Muslim is a Kafir, and the Kafir are the lowest of all creatures. First, let me say this. Um, the book, the, the Quran, the Quran is actually two books. Okay? Um, look in one book, but it's actually two books. You haven't applied the Quran. Uh, they, uh, there was a portion of the Quran that was written in Mecca. And then another portion was written in Medina. The portion that was written in Mecca, this is where you find the uh, verses that are favorable to Christians and Jews. You know, uh, there's no compulsion in religion. Uh, your religion is your religion, my religion is my religion. Things of that type. But Muhammad was run out of Mecca because he insulted the, uh, the pagans there and their deities. And I think over a 13 year period, he, had, he, he got together about 150 followers. So they ran him out and went down into uh, Medina, where he became a warlord, uh, put together uh, a, a mighty army, uh, eradicated several Jewish tribes, and that's where you have the difference, the verses that were written in Medina. One of the verses that you hear constantly is um, chapter 9, verse 29. It talks about kill, kill the unbelievers. Kill the unbelief simply because they're unbelief. Um, because they're not believing in Islam. They don't follow Muhammad. They don't believe in the Prophet. Uh, I'm sorry, they don't follow Allah. They don't believe in the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, the Quran is not written in chronological order. The, uh, there were approximately 114 chapters. And uh, the last chapter that was written is chapter 9. And there's something in Islam called abrogation. So referring back to those really nice verses, you know, your religion is your religion, and Christians and great, Jews are great, those verses have been abrogated by the latter verses. Uh, there's a, a verse, I think it's uh, chapter 2, verse 101, 106, or something like that. And it talks about replacing verses. And we don't eliminate, it says we don't eliminate verses, but we replace the verse. When I say we, we're talking about Allah, the false god of Islam. He refers to himself as we. I don't have a clue why, because he's, he's a Unitarian God. You know? um, so uh, you have to be aware of that. So when you talk to a Muslim, when you're on TV, these guys present themselves as, uh, as Muslims who are devoted and, and uh, connected to the United States, uh, they're giving you 
primarily verses that have been replaced, abrogated by their God. Now, it's kind of somewhat confusing to me why um, I think approximately 61% of the Quran has been abrogated. In other words, have verses that were replaced. So it's kind of puzzling to me why this God, Allah, couldn't give what he wanted to give, the message that he wanted to send the first time. He always came back later, oh, wait, I have a question, I have a better idea, I have a better verse. Well, there's some suspicion that uh, those revelations were actually coming from the Prophet Muhammad, who, by the way, uh, claims he was given a revelation, uh, his revelations from, uh, from God through the angel Gabriel. Okay. But apparently, any time, uh, anything that didn't suit well with Muhammad, where he wanted to change something to his benefit, he got a new revelation. Okay, so the Quran is a central core text believed to be the revelation of God for the Muslims. You have something called the Hadith, which, is, which are the traditions. You know? It's an account of a narrative of uh, what Muhammad did and said. Also, you have the Sira, which is the biography of Muhammad. Then you have the Sunnah, which is the verbal transmission of Muhammad's teachings, deeds, and sayings. So, that verbal transmission is to teach you, the Sunnah is to teach you how to be, be a perfect Muslim. Muhammad is said to be the perfect example of all mankind. When I'm, when I'm making these statements, these are not my opinions. These statements are, are in the Quran or the Hadiths. Okay? So, so the Quran is the, uh, uh, the number one in authority. The Hadiths are, are basically equal to the Quran in authority. Um, the most recognized and used Hadiths in Islam is Sahih Muslim and Sahih Al Bukhari. Okay, they are well respected. However, you have some Muslims who say we don't we don't believe in the hadiths. The reason being is because the hadiths kind of destroy what they believe in. And it backs up the criticism that we have of Islam. I mean, when I say we, I mean Christians, Jews, whoever. Uh, Sharia law. Sharia law, uh, they, took, they took several polls in the United States recently, in Minnesota, Dearborn, Michigan, and asked individuals if they wanted to live under Sharia law or under the constitutional law. Overall, majority said under Sharia law. Uh, Sharia law to a Muslim is the perfect law. Okay, they, they, they believe that's the law given by God. There are four courts of Jewish prudence in Sunni Islam, and the Sunnis are by far the majority of Muslims. They're about 80% of, of the Islamic community. And there are four courts of uh, jurisprudence. And uh, they put together this Sharia law, again, from the Quran, from the Hadiths, from the Sirah, etc. So when we're talking about Muslims, when I'm talking about Muslims, uh, I'm talking about Islamic resources. I'm not giving my opinion. Frequently you find Muslims who don't have a clue about what they believe or what's in their book. Okay, they don't have time to, to, to read the resources. The Quran is very difficult to read. Um, they don't have time to, they don't have the, the financial resources to get the hadith, even though they can be found online now. Okay, they just don't have time to dig into their resources. And when they do, they become very surprised. Um, just kind of throwing things right here. Takiya. Takiya is a doctrine of lying. <clears throat> the Muslims uh, have authority to lie, particularly to the capital, to unbelievers. Mm -hmm. They lie about anything that will advance the cause of Islam. <laughs> so again, when you see CARE uh, on TV or some of these other representatives of the Muslim community who call themselves American, I'm not saying, and I'm not, I'm certainly not saying that all these people are deceptive, but it's difficult to tell because the devout Muslim is deceptive. You know, we are the capital. You know, the worst of all creation, Allah hates us. Okay, Muslims are the best of all creatures. 
Allah loves a Muslim. Okay. So, uh, Now, addressing Allah, the God of Islam, whom some would have us believe is the same God of the Torah and the Gospels. In chapter 3, verse 54, it says that, that Allah is the best of all plotters and planners. You open the Quran to chapter 3, verse 54, it says Allah is the best of all plotters and planners. However, that's not what it says in Arabic. In Arabic, it says Allah is the greatest of all schemers and deceivers. <laughs> so you have, to, you have to, you know, know that they're translating things incorrectly, mm -hmm. uh, purposely. Okay. So yeah. now, um, okay, let's talk about apostates for a second. Apostates, uh, some controversy always whether or not apostates should be killed. Well, no, we, we don't believe that. Uh, yes, they should. Yes, they shouldn't. And, and by the way, what's important is not what the individual believes or not what his opinion is, but what's important is what Allah and Muhammad had said previously. If I, if, if, as a Christian, my beliefs are based on the Gospels. Okay, Jesus Christ. You know, Paul epistles, etc. Okay, so all the time Muslims would give us their opinion. It doesn't line up with what the Quran actually says. So yeah, so past days are to be killed. Um, I'm going to read a couple of verses on that. Whoever changes Sahih, Sahih Al-Bukhari 6922. Whoever changes his Islamic religion, kill him. Can't get any clearer than that. <laughs> Sayyid al Bukhari is one of the authentic, authoritative sources for understanding and bringing clarity to Islam. Uh, Sahih Muslim, 4154. Allah's messenger stood up and said, <clears throat> The blood of a Muslim who bears the testimony that there is no God but Allah and I am his messenger, may be lawfully shed only in the cases of three persons. One, the one who abandons Islam and deserts his community. Two, the married adulterer. And three, the life for life, meaning to kill the fellow Muslim. So again, if one abandons Islam and deserts his community, he's to be murdered, he's to be considered an apostate. What's happening with the Islamic State? ISIL, uh, uh, and this established the uh, caliphate, the Islamic State, we, we find that many Muslims are uh, running for their lives. And that's because they're considered either hypocrites or apostates. Because they're not following the Quran, and the perfect example set forth by Muhammad. Muhammad's example is one of a warlord, as, as I said earlier. He, he, he personally killed seven, eight hundred Jews. Except when he sat there and watched them, he killed, he had Okay. So again, uh, uh, Allah's word. Talking about the Quran and whether or not this word is actually the word of God. Well, this word contradicts. Bible and the Torah. I think we're all aware of that. Um, one of the, no, no, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come back to that. Let's deal with the uh, Trinity. Let's deal with the Trinity. Uh, Muslims will tell you there is no such thing as Trinity. There's no, no word. Uh, and I think Muslims know that, that Trinity does not uh, present itself in the Bible. But the concept is there. Yeah. And in Isaiah 46, 16, 40, 48, 16, we'll find, uh, can, can you read that? 48, 16, we'll find an example of the Trinity. Um, 
when the New Testament when Jesus was baptized and came out of the water. You know, it says the Holy Spirit descended upon them, and God the Father said, This is my son in whom, in whom I am well pleased. We have three persons of Godhead. Mm -hmm. And that word Godhead is in scripture, mm -hmm. signifying that there is a trinity. Amen. 48, 16, and 17. Isaiah 48, 16 and 17. Come closer and listen to this. From the beginning I have told you plainly what would happen. And now the sovereign Lord and his spirit has sent me with this message. This is what the Lord says. Your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you what is good for you and leads you along paths that you should follow. So we have a question that says, I have not spoken in, in, in secret from the beginning, from the time that it was I was there. Now, the Lord God and His Spirit has sent me. There's a person speaking, saying, The Lord God and His Spirit has sent me. And, and 17 says, Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer. I am the Lord your God. There it is, the Old Testament uh, verification of the Trinity. Uh, briefly, I'm going to talk about the position of women in this month. century there was some type of liberation for, for women uh, and, but that was based on how horribly women were treated then. so he relieved some of the uh, stress and, and uh, mistreatment of women at that point you also have uh, so called Muslim feminists which there's no such thing as a Muslim feminist in an Islamic uh, uh, in an Islamic country in, in, a, in a, um, uh, a country that has a uh, dominant Muslim government. No such thing, it, it doesn't exist. At any rate, <coughs> here's what Muhammad thinks of women. He says, men are the maintainers of women because Allah has made some of them to excel others and because they have spent, because they have spent out of their property. The good, woman, the good women are therefore obedient, guarding, and unseen as Allah has guarded. And as to those who, and as to those who, who, and as to those on whose part you fear desertion, admonish them, and leave them alone in the sleeping places, and beat them. Do you understand this? Quran, Quran, verse four thirty four. Uh, men are the maintainers of women. They're disobedient. You admonish them. You separate them to another room. And thirdly, you beat them. Now, some English translations will say lightly. That's not in the Arabic. But yes, Muhammad says you can beat your wife. You know, so for, the, for, the, for the life of me, I can't understand why a woman would want to convert just based on that <laughs> scripture alone. Right. Right. <laughs> Here is, a, <clears throat> again, a thought of Muhammad's from uh, al Qari. A woman came to Muhammad and begged, and begged him to stop her husband from beating her. Her skin was bruised so badly that it's described as being green. Mm -hmm. the, green greener uh, than the green veil she was wearing. Muhammad did not admonish her husband, but instead ordered her to return to him and submit to his sexual desires. Mm -hmm. Now see, these things are written by Muslims, authoritative uh -huh. Muslims. Muslims have authority who are looked upon as knowing what they're talking about. You know, now we're not talking about recently. We talk Al Bakari and Al uh, and, 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 and uh, Sahih Muslim were back in the day. You know, they were the Sahibs of of, uh, of uh, uh, Muhammad. You know, so if you want to know something about anything, you go to to the source closest to that particular event, that particular individual, right? You understand what I'm saying? Okay, a few more here. No, I can't find it, but anyway, <clears throat> it said that uh, the 
testimony of a woman is worth uh, is half that of a man. So if a, if a man is given a testimony in a court of law, then it requires two females to equal that testimony. Okay. Uh, the, uh, a woman's inheritance is is half that of a male, and sometimes even less than that, uh, depending on depending on the circumstances. Um, <clears throat> uh, one second. Sorry. Women are called the tilt of their husbands. The tilt. They're the field for their husbands to plow at any time, We're talking about sexually, that they desire. Which goes back to verse 434 that says that the wife is disobedient mm -hmm. or not adhering to mm -hmm. the desires of the husband, yeah. and beats her. Mm -hmm. you know. And uh, let's talk about the ladies. <laughs> Aisha, oh, well, let's talk about Aisha for a second. Aisha was one of Muhammad's wives. He married her when she was six, and he consummated marriage when she was nine. Now, some of us want to say, not some of us, but some of us want to say that that was a, a cultural thing. Now, there is no nine-year-old girl who is ready for sexual intercourse with a 54-year-old man. You know? And, and uh, today, uh, in Islamic countries, many men marry young girls, even down to one years old. You know, they have something called, and Muslims will deny this. You know, Muslims will deny this. Uh, uh, I've heard excuses like, well, at nine, if the, if the child is menstruating, then, um, you know, it's okay to, to engage in, in, in the colitis. You know, not so, because the child is pregnant. She's not necessarily physically capable of bearing a child. So some someone to attribute this to, to cultural differences. I said no. Um, so again, Muhammad being the perfect example of all mankind, this is frequently followed.
Islamic dilemma. The Islamic dilemma is based on chapter 5, verses 43 and 47. says that the Torah was given as light. And if you don't believe in the Torah, then you'll disbelieve. Um, 46, 546 says, and we cause Jesus, the son of Mary, to follow in their footsteps, confirming that which was revealed before him in the Torah, and we bestow on him the gospel, wherein is guidance and light, confirming that which was revealed before it in the Torah got the guidance and the admonition to those who ward off evil. Verse 47 says, let the people of the gospel, let the people of the gospel, this is specifically talking about Christians, mm -hmm. but sometimes <clears throat> the Quran talks about let the people of the book. That's, that's uh, Christians and Jews inclusive, right? But here it says, let the people of the gospel judge by that which Allah hath revealed therein. Whosoever judges not, judges not by that which Allah has revealed, such are evil livers. <clears throat> Let the people of the gospel judge by that which Allah has revealed therein. Let the people of the gospel judge by what Allah has revealed therein. So if we're to judge anything coming out of the Quran, we're to judge by the gospel. When we go to the gospel and make a judgment, the Quran is incorrect. The Quran does not agree with us. So here's, here's the key to this verse. This, this verse here has gotten a number of Muslims say 547. <clears throat> in Arabic, this verse is written in what's called the present tense continuous. Present tense continuous. It was good when it was written in the seventh century. It applied then and applied now. Okay, so anything that we to judge. We as Christians go back to the gospel. You understand that, right? Yeah. Okay. So now, if the if the Quran is right, that we're to judge by what's in the gospels, then and if the gospels are correct, then the Quran is wrong. Okay? I'm not going to relate this, but I really do. Uh, also, there are plenty of scriptures that say that uh, take not the Jews and the Christians for friends. They are, they are for friends to one another. Uh, uh, um, just, you can take a, a Christian as a friend uh, and, and a devout Muslim will give you that impression, but he hates you in his heart. That's that's the instruction. You know, you, you can make him appear that way, you know, because you want to advance Islam. You know, devout Muslims, good Muslims. Let me talk about good Muslims. Here. We hear about moderate Muslims, and, and and we hear about good Muslims in the United States, good Muslims in other countries. Well, they're good Muslims according to whose opinion? Right. Not according to, not according to the Quran, the Hadith. The Sunnah, the Syrah. The good Muslims are the ones that call them radicals. Mm -hmm. ISIL. Mm -hmm. They're the ones living by the perfect example that Muhammad has set. Mm -hmm. You know, so right. what appears to be good Muslims in our sight are not good Muslims in the sight of Muhammad and his God Allah. Therefore, ISIL is killing them. Right. They're hypocrites, they're apostates, they, they, they believe in heresy. Mm -hmm. 
we even have um, people in the United States and in Europe, and in Europe talking about uh, reformation, reformation of the Quran. Well, Allah says that once you get the decision, there's no other option. I think that's in verse 30, chapter 33, verse 36, 36 to 26. He says, once he's made a decision, you have no option. So how are you going to reform Islam? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And now, Islamic dilemma. Now I have so many, so many statistics, and it would take days to see and read it to be very boring as probably is now, but just a wealth of information here. As I'm looking for this, let me tell you that. Paradise. Paradise, paradise is your man consists of, uh, well, it, your immediate interest, entrance into paradise is through jihad. You, you die fighting the coffin. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why those guys are willing to build themselves up, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. You know, and when they get there, they immediately get 72 virgins. You can hear about 72 virgins. Well, that's the minimum. <laughs> you know, and, and, and then, then you part of it in, in, in Las Vegas. You know, I mean, there's wine and et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, I haven't found out what the women get. You know, women are said to be standing in corners, their wives standing in corners and uh, waiting to be visited by their husbands. You know, they certainly don't get uh, 72 men, 72 virgin males, you know. Um, uh, and, and speaking about, speaking on that, uh, as you know, Muslim men are allowed to have up to four wives. Mm -hmm. yeah. But in having those four wives, they don't have to tell the other wives that they're married. They really don't have to do that. No. no. So you're talking about inequality. Muslim women can't marry four men. You know? And and what Muslim women cannot marry uh, anyone that's not a Muslim. However, Muslim men can marry Christians, Jews, anyone they, they choose. And one of the reasons for that is because when their children are born, they're counted as Muslims. You know, the father has the authority over them. I'm, I'm sure you might have uh, uh, heard of some cases where Muslim men married American women and then took the kids back. They were not able to get them. You know, under, under uh, Sharia law, they have the rights to the kids. Okay. Speaking of Jesus. Uh, Chapter 4, verse 157, 158. And because of their saying, we slew the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, Allah's messenger, they slew him not, nor crucified him. But it appeared so unto them. And lo, those who disagree concerning it are in doubt thereof. They have no knowledge thereof, save pursuit of a conjecture. They slew him not. They said in boast, this is Yusuf Ali, like one of the top guys in translating the Quran. Yusuf Ali, they said in boast, we kill Christ Jesus, the son of Mary. He's talking about the Jews. Now, what Jew do you think would boast of killing the Messiah? You know? I mean, that, that's, that's an insane statement. Not even the Pharisee would be boasting and joking about killing the Messiah. Okay. Um, in fact, we know that uh, at one time they would even say the name Yahweh, or however you want to pronounce it, mm -hmm. and the English translation of Jehovah. Mm -hmm. my, my Hebrew, I don't have Hebrew, so I say Yahweh, some people say other things. Remember, they wrote something called the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H. They wouldn't even say Yahweh. So they certainly would not boast of killing the Messiah. That's a blunder. Um, but they killed him not, nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them, those who differ therein are full of doubts, with no certain knowledge, the only conjecture follow, for assurance they killed him not. Nay, Allah raised him up into himself, and Allah is exalted in power. So it said that Jesus Christ was not crucified, and die, he was raised up. So if you look at the text, the text here, the text here is a commentary that kind of gives some clarity to these verses. Okay, so if you look at the text here, 
Well, first, if you ask Muslims, Muslims tell, some Muslims will tell you it was Judas. Some Muslims will tell you that it was some other unidentified person. Some will tell you it was a person that looked something like Jesus because <laughs> the people who looked a great deal like me and they mistaked, they mistook this person for Jesus. Mm -hmm. now, but the tafsir, the, 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 the authority, says that it was a young disciple who was made to look like Jesus. That he was cloning, basically. You know. But we're talking about this person on the cross who deceived the mother, Mary, the disciples, many disciples, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, how is this possible? How is this possible? It's not possible. Well, it's only, it is only, it's possible only under the fact that Allah made this individual to appear exactly like Jesus. It says Jesus was lifted up. The story goes in, in the tafsir that Jesus was taken up, he was put to sleep, he was taken up in the air, taken into heaven, to paradise. And Allah never told anybody about this. For 600 years, Allah never mentioned that he had deceived all these people. Allah, who knew a God who is omniscient, all-knowing, who had to know that as a result of his deception, there would be two billion Christians even today who would believe in that crucifixion and resurrection. So of course, it's necessary for necessary for Allah to take away the crucifixion because without, without the crucifixion there is no resurrection. Without the resurrection uh, we have no salvation. Uh, so that's where the enemy has gone with that. Again, uh, again, so when Allah does come and reveal that he was only playing a joke, he was being deceptive, as in, again, chapter 3, verse 54, where it says that he is the greatest of all schemers and deceivers. He didn't go to the Jews. He didn't go to the people that he, he deceived. He went to a, an Arab. Someone who the Christians and the Jews they had no reason to believe him. They didn't believe him. All the prophets were Jews. No, but he's going to stand there. He's going to go to an Arab and they're supposed to believe him. Then he was the least likely person that they would believe. Okay. So, um, this, this deception has also led to bathed people going to hell according to the doctrine of, of uh, Islam. Anything else we can say about that? Again, <clears throat> so that verse, that Quranic blunder that I, I, I call it, well, chapter 4, verse 157, 158, it contradicts Psalm 2. Psalm 22, we are familiar with those, those talks about the crucifixion, okay? Um, and, and written by David 1600 years before uh, Muhammad was born. Then we also have Isaiah 53, which was written about 13, approximately 1350 years before Muhammad was born. We have Daniel 926, 927, that prophecy, that prophecy in Daniel chapter 9 is called the hub of all prophecy. You know, Check it out sometime. Check out chapter 9 of Daniel. And uh, in fact, he prophesied to the very day that the Christ would appear and that the Christ would uh, be crucified. Be cut off. They refer to it as being cut off anyway. Um, also, uh, it, it, it contradicts the New Testament, obviously. Here's something that was written that says it was all Allah's fault that we believe what we believe. So since Muslims stopped complaining about Christians saying Allah is a liar and Muhammad is a false prophet, because if it wasn't for Allah, none of this would have ever happened. It took him 600 years to fess up to his lies, then he didn't have courage to show up and talk to an angel. Uh, he didn't send an angel to the people he deceived most, but to an Arabic man. Christian Jews would most certainly not believe. 
So the God of the Quran is a deceiver, a false God. I'm going to give you one last scripture, um, two last scriptures. In the Quran, it says that Allah has no son. He can't have a son because he has no consul. He has no wife. This is a ridiculous statement. <laughs> he has no son because he has no consul, no wife. First John 2, 22, 23. Can you read that? Wait, 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 no, 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 Allah has no son. Spirit of the Antichrist. Okay? Yep. It says, whosoever denies the son and does not have the father either. That is, whosoever denies the son does not have the father either. But he who acknowledges the son has the father also. And there's many, many other uh, 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 proofs and things that you can, you know, con that any contradictions that come out of the uh, Quran, scientific stuff like the, the moon, uh, the sun sets in a, in a, in a puddle of Water and all that kind of crazy stuff. Okay, we're gonna see this last video of Brother Lou's gonna close this out. Dear Mr. President, with all due respect, sir, I must tell you that you are wrong about ISIL. You said ISIL speaks for no religion. I'm a former Muslim. My dad is an Imam. I spent more than 20 years studying Islam. I hold a bachelor degree in religious studies, and I'm in the middle of my master's degree in terrorism studies. I can tell you with confidence that ISIL speaks for Islam. Allow me to correct you, Mr. President. ISIL is a Muslim organization. Its name stands for Islamic State. So even the name suggests that it is an Islamic movement. Their leader, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, holds a PhD in Islamic studies. I doubt you know Islam better than he does. He was a preacher and a religious leader in one of the local mosques in Baghdad. ISIL's 10,000 members are all Muslims. None of them are from any other religion. They come from different countries and have one common denominator, Islam. They are following Islam's prophet Muhammad in every detail. They imitate him by growing their beards, shaving their mustaches, and in the way they dress. They follow his command in the hadith to differentiate themselves from the infidels by wearing, by wearing their watches on the right instead of the left hand. They implement Sharia in every piece of land they conquer. They pray five times a day. They have called for a caliphate, which is a central doctrine in Sunni Islam, and they are willing to die for their religion. They are following the steps of Islam's prophet Muhammad to the letter. By the way, if you want to understand ISIL, read the oldest biography of Muhammad by Ibn Hisham. This is their model for action. You think that ISIL does not speak for Islam because they beheaded an American and they killed those whom they consider infidels. In the same way, Islam's prophet Muhammad beheaded in one day between 600 and 900 adult males in a Jewish tribe called Banu Quraiza. In fact, Beheading is commanded in the Quran, in Surah 47, the fourth verse. It says, when you meet the unbelievers and fight, smite at their necks. Ironically, this Surah is called the Surah of Muhammad. Killing prisoners is also an order from Allah to Muhammad and to all Muslims. It says, it is not for a prophet to have captives of war until he inflicts a massacre upon Allah's enemies in the land. Quran 8, 67. 
And by the way, three of Muhammad's wives were Jewish girls he kidnapped from his raids on the religious minorities, just as ISIL is doing today. Mr. President, I grew up in Morocco, supposedly a moderate country, yet I still learned at a young age to hate the enemies of Allah, especially Jews and Christians. These are represented today by Israel and the West, especially the great Satan, America. I prayed five times a day, repeating Al-Fatiha, the first chapter in the Quran, asking Allah to lead me not in the way of those who went astray and those who have the wrath of Allah upon them. We all knew that it is Jews and Christians. We have been brainwashed to hate all of you in our sacred texts, in our prayers, in our Friday sermons, in our educational systems. We were ready to join any group that one day would fight you and destroy you and make Islam the religion of the whole world, as the Quran says. This is what I and millions like me have been taught. Mr. President, this is an irrevocable fact. Fortunately, when I grow up, I choose to leave Islam and became a Christian because I believe that God is love. Others also left and still every day they are leaving Islam and choosing different paths for their lives. All of them are suffering today because again, Islam's prophet Muhammad said, whoever changes his religion, kill him. I left Morocco under persecution. I was fortunate. Others throughout the Muslim world do not have the same opportunity. They are paying a heavy price in different ways in order to get their freedom one day. I ask you, Mr. President, to stop being politically correct, to call things by their names. ISIL, Al-Qaeda, Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, the Taliban, and their sister brand names are all made in Islam. Unless the Muslim world deals with Islam and separates religion from state, we will never end this cycle. Until you deal with the root of the problem, you will be just dealing with the symptoms. ISIL is just one symptom. If it disappears, other ISILs will be born under different names. You might ask, then why does ISIL kill other Muslims? The answer is that they consider them infidels, not Muslims. Do you know that all four schools in Islam agree that if a Muslim stops praying, he should be asked to repent, and if he does not, he should be killed? Do you know that Muhammad tried to burn his own companions when they stopped coming to prayers? So anything that qualifies a Muslim to be an infidel can be a reason for killing him even neglecting to pray. If Islam is not the problem, then why is it that there are millions of Christians in Middle East and yet none of them has ever blown up himself to become a martyr? Even though they live under the same economic and political circumstances and even worse. Why have many Muslims in the West also joined ISIL if Islam is not the reason? Why have even new converts to Islam become terrorists? Mr. President, if you really want to fight terrorism, then fight it at the root. How many Saudi sheikhs are preaching hatred? How many Islamic channels are indoctrinating people and teaching them violence from the Quran and the Hadith? How many Friday sermons are made against the West freedom and democracy? How many Islamic schools are producing generations of teachers and students who believe in jihad and martyrdom and fighting the infidels? And finally, how many websites are funded by governments, your allies, that have sheikhs or issue fatwas against basic human rights? If you want to fight terrorism, start from there. By the way, I do not give my full name because Islam is a religion of peace. I'm known around the whole world as Brother Rashid, and I implore you to take a stand for international human rights and the future of democracy 
and speak the truth about the real threat that is facing all of us. Best regards, Brother Rashid. Anyway, I'm closing out. Uh, thank you, folks, for listening. Thank you for your patience. Uh, Brother, you want to take us out?